We think women need to talk more openly about money because money really matters. It shouldn't be embarrassing or confusing. Join the conversation. We'll be discussing a whole range of topics which will help you get comfortable with your finances. Money Matters, brought to you by AJ Bell. Hello and welcome to the Money Matters podcast. As promised, this is another special episode, though when we've said that, the research that we're actually talking about today is completely at the heart of our campaign. So it's special, but it's also sort of integral to the whole thing. With me as ever, Laura Souter. Hi, Laura. Hi, Danny. Yes, yeah, so we launched Money Matters because we know that women are saving and investing less than men. Uh, we know that they had less in their pension pots, putting away less for the future. Um, and that's despite the fact that women on average live longer than men and so actually need more in their pension pots to last them through retirement. And we've been trying to get conversations going since then about why that might be and help to bust that gender wealth gap. And our latest big chance of research is just really trying to help identify some of those problem areas, some of those financial wobbly bits, as we've called them, um, that people will encounter in life and that disproportionately affect women. Yeah, because we wanted with this podcast, with the whole Money Matters campaign to talk about money, to talk about the good, the bad and, yeah, to be fair, the downright ugly. And I do think that we have achieved that because we've spoken about topics from divorce, the menopause, pretty much everything that impacts a woman's financial journey through life and all those potholes that it is so easy to fall into. Yeah, and so the latest research really digs into those, digs into the implications of all of those points in life and how they might lead to your finances getting derailed. Now, for some women, only some of these areas will affect them. For some women, all of them will affect them. And like you say, for some, there will be a just a small speed bump in the road. For others, there will be a huge pothole. But as well as identifying those areas, we also really wanted to provide a toolkit for women to overcome them. So we're all about looking at what the problems are, but also providing the solutions rather than just presenting all of the slightly grim data and then leaving people to deal with it. So we've got a really helpful toolkit in there for each area of your life to work out how you can overcome those financial hurdles or mitigate the impact of them. And then a kind of overall financial toolkit of some of the things that you could be doing to boost your finances. And we hope it's useful because we also talk about our financial wobbly bits. And, and I've spoken about this before, but for me, definitely the, the point in my life where I felt my confidence was really affected and I did have to make some pretty tough choices about what I wanted to do with my career. That was during the menopause because I, I went through this period of total brain fog. I mean, they, they tell you about baby brain. Did you experience baby brain, Laura? Yeah, one day I forgot the word for toes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a low point. <laughs> I was broadcasting and suddenly couldn't remember things that I needed to say. So, you know, I, I'd be talking about somebody and I couldn't remember their name. And if you're on telly, you can't have all this stuff written down. You know, you have to try and remember it. It is quite complicated. And, and i I just couldn't. I just suddenly had these moments where absolutely, just like baby brain, I just couldn't remember crucial bits of information. And it took me a, a quite a while, a number of years to, to really get to grips with it and to get prescribed with HRT. And I did did think about how it was going to impact my career. And I did change jobs because of it, although I was lucky enough in that it impacted my career for the better. But that's my biggest financial wobble. You are much younger than I am, so I imagine you've not got anywhere near this point yet. No, no, I'm not. But I think if I think back, one of my, I think my biggest kind of financial crunch time is probably right now with a big mortgage and a huge childcare bills to pay each month. But I think 
actually, maybe I was quite well prepared for that because of my job at the moment. And I knew that this was going to be, you know, a financially tricky time in life. I think the area that I found much harder was when my partner and I were first together. Um, We've moved in together and we decided to merge our finances, which I know is a very controversial and much discussed topic (laughs) of how couples share their finances. But for us at the time, it made sense. But the difficult discussions around how we spent money and we had very different spending styles, um, very different spending patterns, very different priorities of how we wanted to spend our money. And it ensued a lot of conversations, a lot of arguments as well around how it was best to do that. And I think that really taps into one of the key themes in our report, which is a lot of the solutions, not all, but a lot of the solutions involve quite tricky conversations, whether that's with your employer around the menopause and how your um, work and your job could change to fit around your symptoms, whether it's with a partner when you're just about to have children, how you're going to split the cost of having children, um, or whether it's how you split the money as a couple. A lot of it involves these slightly uncomfortable conversations about money where we have to um, also maybe learn some things about our own habits and our own spending that aren't particularly nice. (laughs) But I also think it's become more okay to talk about this. I mean, we started doing this a couple of years ago and we sort of launched by saying, look, it's rude to talk about money. Well, no, it's not. It's not rude to talk about money because you'd go down the pub and you'd talk to your friends about your sex life probably, but so many of my friends wouldn't talk about money. And I think particularly with the cost of living crisis, that has changed, but also because there is now so much stuff out there for people to take a look at, to learn from, and then hopefully that starts conversations as well. Exactly. And I think it is the cost of living crisis has definitely made talking about money a bit more pub chat and a bit more accessible. Everyone's talking about when their mortgage is up for renewal or how much it's gone up by or how much their energy bills have gone up by. And so I think that that definitely has helped make it less of a taboo subject, which I am all here for. And I think because we're all in it together as well, that I think that that has also helped make it less of a taboo subject. We're going to hear from Money Matters founding ambassador, the brilliant Baroness Helena Morrissey shortly. She's going to talk through more of the findings of the report. But if you haven't seen it, do take a look on our website, ajbellmoneymatters.co.uk. You cannot miss it. Just pop on there. It's got a brilliant infographic, which will take you through everything. And as Laura says, it's got a toolkit. So it's not just saying where we're all going wrong, but it's also maybe steering you towards the possibility of, of helping you turn things around if you're struggling. And do let us know what you think about it. Um, We want to hear all feedback. You can message us on social media. You can find us at AJ Bell Money Matters on most platforms. Um, And also just to signal what we've got coming up, we've got a free in-person event in Leeds if you're based in the area. It's on World Menopause Day, which is October the 18th. You can also find details of that on our website, which is ajbellmoneymatters.co.uk. You can sign up to our newsletter there so you're first to hear about any future events or research reports or podcasts or everything else that we're doing here. Yeah, and Baroness Helena Morrissey is going to be there. Also, our charity partner, SmartWorks, as well. Um, We'd love it if you're around, you want to come along. It's a totally free event. Come have a chat, glass of fizz. Uh, There are some absolutely fascinating findings in the report, and we're going to chat about a couple of the bits that really caught our attention after we hear from Helena. So we're here today to discuss our biggest research report yet, which is Wobbly Bits. We've got Baroness Helena Morrissey with us today. She's one of the founders of Money Matters and probably needs no introduction. But just in case you're not aware, she spent three decades in the financial services industry. She founded the 30% Club to get more women on company boards. And she's written two books. She is now chair of the Diversity Project too, and also no stranger to the podcast as she was on one of our first episodes. So Helena, welcome. Thanks, Laura. Well, it's great to be back. Um, So let's start with, why don't you tell us what Wobbly Bits is all about and why the team wanted to do the research? Okay, well, our first piece of research about a year ago um, really highlighted what a giant investment gap there is between men and women in Britain. 
Um, an aggregate that comes out at 1.65 trillion pounds, at least that's what our research told us last year. Now that doesn't mean anything to most people in terms of what it, what's the individual sums, um, but it actually suggests that women at that point anyway, a year ago, had less than 50,000 pounds in savings uh, and investments and men had over 110,000 pounds. So a giant gap on an individual basis. And we always knew there was no single reason behind that, but we wanted to find out what were the different reasons um, and therefore what actions can we women take to make sure we don't suffer from that you know, gap between us and men. Now we've controversially perhaps called it wobbly bits. Um, I'm sure some of you will absolutely hate that name. Um, there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, we want to tell it as it is. I mean, the reality is that uh, we women do have lots of moments in our life um, and the research backs that up uh, where we wobble financially. And um, what we're trying to do is address those. Um, frankly, as well, uh, there's been a lot of reports and a lot of them are wonderful, lots of interesting things in it, very worthy, but no one really pays much attention. I, I hope the name doesn't put people off reading this um, because it's full of valuable findings and obviously, most importantly, actions that we can take to protect ourselves. And so let's dive into some of those findings. Why don't you talk through some of the most important ones that you found from their data? Because there is a lot of data in there, isn't there? There is a lot of data. Um, I guess the things that jumped out to, to me, uh, first of all, was just how early our anxiety about money starts. Um, only, well, just 35 um, percent of women um, don't think that they will be able to pay off even their student debt compared with just uh, 20 percent of men so right at the beginning and that's actually even though they take on a higher debt level when they're students so we start off being pessimistic about our control over our financial well-being really early on and of course the cumulative effect is very important um very few of us successfully negotiate a pay rise um just 40% of us even ask, and only a third of those of us who ask achieve a pay rise. Uh, again, a big gap between ourselves and men on that. Childcare and uh, responsibility over arranging it and paying for it. I mean, three times as many women take on the responsibility for childcare arrangements and payments. Um, so those were the big ones that stood out for me. Obviously, as we carry on through life, um, as we would expect, you know, we're more pessimistic that we'll have enough in our pension pot. To have a comfortable retirement. Um, some of us struggle over the menopause financially. And of course, um, we if we go through a divorce, then um, again, we forget to ask our ex-partner about say, their, their pension. So there's a lot in there. Um, but for me, it was really this accumulation of, I'm going to call them missteps that we take. Um, sometimes we're just not, I suppose, uh, feeling confident enough. You know, we are, it seems, just a bit more at the mercy of what life is going to throw at us financially at least. Yeah, and I think it's really important that we see that kind of cumulative effect and obviously not all of those things will impact all women. We talked about childcare, they're not not every woman has children and we talked about divorce, for example. Um, not everyone goes through that, but but it's that kind of cumulative effect of all of those different factors that might affect you that that really build up to your wealth. But were there particular findings that that surprised you within there? Um, I guess the childcare one did because I my um, perhaps naive assumption these days, and certainly in our work with the Diversity Project, we see a lot more companies offering um, equal paid parental leave. Um, I certainly talk to some fantastic men who expect to play a big part in their children's upbringing and obviously care at the early stage. So I guess I was surprised to see, um, perhaps not completely shocked, but that women are so disproportionately taking financial responsibility for childcare. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the menopause issues, again, um, there was no big thing that stood out as being a real financial single risk. But again, sort of chipping away at women's uh, ability to take control over their own financial destiny at a later point in life. Um, I found that sobering. And I guess the childcare element for people that don't know, you do have nine children. So that must have been, um, childcare costs must have socked up a lot of your money over the years. To be honest, it's the one that really resonates with me because, I mean, when I had my first child, I was quite young by sort of professional woman's standards. I was 25 and uh, he was born in 1991, which many of the viewers, um, listeners might not be old enough to remember was a year of uh, extremely high interest rates and my husband and I we only had a tiny flat in Battersea 
but we had a very large mortgage, we had negative equity. And then when, we, when I went back to work, um, uh, the, the nursery costs, um, I mean, I remember it so clearly, 225 pounds a week, which I'm sure absolutely pales into insignificance in today's prices. <laughs> But we literally, between us, and my husband and I both worked full time then, but neither of us were really established in our careers. We didn't earn either of us very much money. Um, we just could not, you know, when we added up all the bills, um, we didn't have enough post-tax income. And of course, that's a very unsustainable situation, very stressful. Mm. And, um, if anyone ever asked me, you know, what's driven me on my career, I must admit that moment when I knew that I had to earn more money my uh, job had more earnings potential than my husband's really mm. um and it wasn't sort of in any way materialistic it was absolutely needs must <laughs> it was like we are not going to be able to afford this and I had to take a decision we had to take a decision that was joint that by going back to work um eventually we would between us be able to earn more money and obviously pay down more debts um but honestly it was so stressful and I really really empathize with women who now say can't afford to go back to work um obviously now we have some child care vouchers um but also i do suggest that we we learn how to ask for a pay rise better because um i think a lot of bosses they knew the maths they would rather pay someone a bit more than see them leave the company because they can't afford child care i think particularly in a kind of current um jobs market, which is quite, you know, the, the experts call it quite tight, which basically means that it's harder for companies to hire. There are more companies out there hiring people. And so I think it, you're in, as a worker, you're in a more powerful position. And so if you are in that situation at the moment of thinking, I'm only going to break even or I'm or I'm not even going to be able to cover my childcare costs, you are in a great kind of position to go in and ask for a pay rise because employers do really value people who've stayed for a while and they know that they can do the job. Um, but also, they have to. They have to. If you leave, then they have to pay recruitment agency. Um, there's hassle, and you know, motto to take away from all of this is: if you don't ask, you don't get. Really, you know, you might. They might say no, but um, there'll be no harm in asking. And I do think, you know, again, we need to, as women, value our contribution, and you know, it's part of our self esteem as well. You know, do we actually think we're worth it? I sound like one of those ads for makeup now, but anyway, <laughs> and asking. Um, you know, you, again, some they might say no, they might say it's not affordable, they might say there's a pay freeze, et cetera. But um, I, I really think a message from this report is that very relatively few women ask and therefore it's perhaps not surprising that we, we don't receive. And it's tough, I think, isn't it? When you return from maternity leave, you don't necessarily feel on the most solid footing. You kind of maybe don't feel your most confident self. You're going back into work after a break away from it. So I get that that is kind of a tricky mindset to get into. But equally, you're right. It is about women being so much more confident in their own worth um, at work and and the knowledge that actually if they moved elsewhere, they could probably get paid more and, and their replacement, like you say, would get paid more. So it's having the confidence to do that. And if you uh, say you might not feel confident, um, a lot of it's about acting. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know, Laura, you've been through retaining from maternity leave much more recently than I have, so um, you'll have first-hand experience as well. But I, I do remember, you know, when I went back after um, the, my first child, I was passed over for promotion. Um, I desperately needed that promotion, so I had to get a pay rise with it, and it did, as I said earlier, make me determined. Um, even if I didn't feel very on top to be honest and I guess one of the messages here is how do we how do we cope with um you know those 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 life moments when um our confidence might be knocked uh, and yet we don't want to also be poorer um because we we've lost that confidence so th these things are sort of two halves of the same coin um I think if we can take more control over our money feel more confident about asking for money when we when we need it um and know our own worth, then again, perhaps some of the you know disparities between men and women at work will disappear as well. And you touched on the kind of menopause area of the research, and I found those figures particularly so shocking. So, um, for example, one in 20 women who've gone through the menopause have stopped working as a result, and one in 25 reduced their hours because their symptoms meant that they felt like they couldn't work full-time, for example. I mean, those are pretty big figures when we think about it as a proportion of the population as a whole um 
And we can really see there the, the impact, the direct impact that it has on not only your career, but also your finances of, of going through that. Definitely. Um, I think it's good news that we're talking about the menopause more. This is, you know, in your introduction, you were saying that not everyone will have children or um, or get divorced, thank goodness, but um, we will all go through the menopause. And so I think it's it's encouraging that employers are now starting to think, actually, what can we do to help? Um, although I still think it's it's something that more needs to be done on. I, I agree entirely, and I actually went through menopause when it was lockdown and I was trying to switch from an executive career to non-executive work. Um, not that that sounds like a big deal, but actually it was quite a different change in pace. I was certainly having to interview a lot and suddenly I went from, you know, everything sort of feeling like I was on top of it to then uh, feeling a bit chaotic and worried about money and financial security uh, because I'd sort of assumed I would be able to make that transition both physically and in my career. Um, and of course, on top of that, you have physical symptoms, um, which may not be easily addressed, particularly at, at first. So uh, I think it, I definitely sympathize with uh, other women and obviously some suffer very severe symptoms, um, but those tend not to last forever. And that's the other thing that would be great for employers to recognize that obviously, um, you know, it, it's really worth persevering and helping women through some of these stages in their life because you know you've got people who are being incredibly loyal who have great experience um and who will want to you know repay i suppose the sort of confidence that an employer will have in them if they help them during, during the when times are tough yeah and i think for, for a lot of people that might just be small changes to how their job is or how their hours are or temporary changes that that aren't dramatic but i completely acknowledge that it's an maybe an uncomfortable conversation for people to raise, particularly if they're not particularly close to their boss. Um, but I guess it's about seeking out someone sympathetic in the business who's more senior or even in the HR department and starting that conversation with them. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that you sort of march up or try to march up to <laughs> a male boss who you might feel is very, um, you know, somebody this uh, difficult, they might not resonate with them at all. Um, it is important to get allies. It is important to have mentors. Um, there'll be somebody, you know, as, as I say, not exactly an unusual situation. Perhaps you can ask an old senior woman um, for her help um, if you're about to go through the menopause or going through it. And um, again, what we're not trying to do here is, is say all oh, women are problem, you know, problem children, as it were. We're not saying women need, you know, lots of sort of constant nurturing and caring for, but we are sort of different in certain respects. And uh, that some of that's biology that we can do nothing about. Some of it is, you know, the way that societally uh, we've grown up. Um, and I think earlier in a version of this report, Lauren, you said women are less bullshit. You don't ask for a pay rise, but you know, <laughs> we can ask. I'd ask you to take that word out. It's, it's not being bullshit, but but you know, we may not be quite so demanding. We may be, you know, I remember as a young woman, particularly putting my head down, working the longest hours somehow expecting that my work would be noticed and I would be rewarded for that. And I learned that's not what happens. I learned that you have to actually speak up for yourself, stand up for yourself, and that can feel very uncomfortable. Um, so this is not all about us asking for everyone else to help us. This is about helping ourselves as well. Yeah, and I think that's a really important part of it as well, isn't it? And I think um, it's about offering the kind of solutions as well rather than there's other reports of this ilk that kind of just say these are the figures and and this is how women and men's finances diverge. But what I think was really important to us is to offer some solutions as well, wasn't it? Definitely. And I guess um, as one works through this, and hopefully a lot of women will read this, and not everything will apply, as we've said, but there'll be something to think, actually, you know, if I just control over, you know, not knowing what's in my pension, I mean, that comes out, um, that how many was it? It was a... Um, I forgot how many said that they didn't know how much was in their pension. Do you remember that statistic, Laura? Um, but it was quite a shocking um, proportion of women and certainly much higher than men. Um, yeah, so I think it was a third of women who said they had no idea how much yeah, was yeah. in their pension pot. And that's just such an easy area where people, women can engage more with their pension and with their finances, isn't it? Exactly. Some of this stuff seems boring. I mean, I'm going to be honest, even though mm. I work in finance and have been in pensions as well in terms of managing money, I didn't sort out, you know, I had pension bits in different places um, and it wasn't um, until I was about to turn 55 
that I thought actually I must just really know where's who's who's got what you know where it's invested um and so I worked on that sort of consolidation of my pension pod and um and then took action really because it, it felt to me that it wasn't quite right in terms of how it was invested uh for sort of later life and that made me feel very empowered you know I know it was it, it, somewhat pathetic as I say not knowing um but I went from feeling worried about it to now feeling in control and again the, these are not necessarily huge to have to sort of set aside a week of your life you can do I did you know every Sunday afternoon I did an hour on my pension for a few weeks and gradually it all came together so getting in those good habits um, moving from anxiety about worry to really feeling in control um that's what we're trying to achieve there I think that's such an important point because I think often when we talk about these things, it's with a bit of a negative slant of, you know, women have less money or women need to engage with this area. But actually, like you say from personal experience, and I know myself, tackling some of these things that have been in the back of your mind that you think I really need to sort that out, actually getting around to doing it. Firstly, with a lot of these things, I realized that they were much quicker to sort out than I'd been building them up to be. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, you have so much more of a kind of positive feeling which then I think is quite motivational to tackling other areas of your finance or keeping engaged with your finances so I think rather than viewing this as a kind of a negative aspect there's a real feel-good aspect to it as well isn't there I hope so and I hope people will think actually um yes uh the wobbly bit sounds that uh, sounds sort of anxious making or nerve-wracking or just play bad you know that one has wobbles in life um but it is about you know taking control over them and it is about feeling um none of this is going to necessarily happens to you you know we can we can obviously there are bad things sometimes people don't get the jobs they deserve necessarily or something goes wrong in their life but there's a lot of things that we do have agency over and um you know pension find that out making sure that we're savvy if we are going through something like getting a divorce and making sure that we're not worse off than we need be because we understand that you know ex-partner might have a pension somewhere um you know mortgages um you know what came out of the report is that men tend to contribute more to the deposit and that probably makes women feeling like they're less important in you know the the relationship or less financially um you know equal um and again we might not be able to afford to pay so much because we have on average lower pay but again that goes back to making sure that we understand our position understand what we can do about that um and hopefully uh feel incentivized to to take control as i said earlier and there are a couple of kind of action points or solutions that you hope that people take away from this report any kind of easy wins or things that people can do that we haven't already covered well, first of all, I would like everyone, uh, if possible, because everyone's going to have a list, a, a sort of a worry list down. Um, and it is going to vary from one person to another. So that's where I go from report being sort of the aggregate picture to then what really um, resonates with, with the individual. So I think then focusing on which areas of your finance, um, and obviously, again, it will be t time of life dependent, uh, make you anxious and not feeling it's not going to happen to you, but actually one of the small steps, um, it might be, for example, if you're weighed down by very uh, high mortgage payments at present, and that's obviously been very much in the news of late. Um, you know, have you renegotiated your mortgage? Um, are you are you getting the best deal? Um, and obviously, you know, that might enable you to feel much more uh, confident about the next few months, at least. Um, so again, everybody write a list, everybody think which bits apply to me. And I would be really surprised if people read this, if we read this and think, oh, I'm all okay. <laughs> that would be my <laughs> great hope, but it's um, it's uh, it's unlikely. And you know, talk about it some more. I think that's the other thing I would encourage. Um, we don't talk about money enough in this country. We're always a bit embarrassed about it. And I think one of the reasons why we keep seeing a lot of effort around trying to encourage women to save and invest and why very little seems to stick is because, you know, again, we don't follow up as individuals. We don't talk about our hopes as well as our fears on money uh, with our friends, with our family. Um, let's see what each of us can do to uh, consider money and financial fitness to be another part of your life, like physical fitnesses or mental health well-being. So um, that's the ambition here. And I, I really hope that there is something in it for everybody. 
And to put you on the spot then, if you could go go back looking at some of the kind of financial moves that you've made in your in your life, are there any steps that you wish you'd taken in your life that this report kind of highlights? Are there any ones where you read a particular wobbly bit area and you thought, gosh, that was me? Well, I guess um, it's a bit general, but overall, I felt I've always taken a little bit of a Macorba approach. Something would always turn up and I wish I'd done more planning. And I think that goes back to, you know, if you start off, I didn't actually have student debt, but I had a very low salary and too many outgoings at the start. And it always felt like I was playing catch up. And if I had just, you know, sat down early on, written my budget out, um, be honest with myself about what I needed to do to overcome the shortfall each month that I went through for several years. Um, I just would have felt less anxious about it at every stage of the way. So being more thoughtful uh, and planning, including for those moments when you really feel anxious. And, um, because it's un- unusual that you will completely run out of options. And I'm not being naive here. I know that people can't just leave and get a higher paying job, as we've suggested sometimes, but politicians or get a second job you might be working incredibly long hours but working out you know a plan uh that means you don't feel there's this albatross around your neck um that actually you can enjoy life and there may be moments when you haven't got quite enough to to do all the things you want to do but you can do the things you need to do amazing thank you so much for talking through all of that and hopefully people get lots out of this report but we really appreciate you explaining it all It's a pleasure. Thanks, Laura. Helena sums it up absolutely brilliantly, but this is a meaty report. It's taken us a long time to go through some of the findings, and there's so much in it that she has not talked about. I think, Laura, for me, the bit that really caught my attention was the number of 18 to 34-year-olds saying that they don't think that they'll ever have kids because of the financial strain it would put on their lives. I mean, it's a fifth of people saying that they think that the financial implications will probably mean that they will decide not to have children. And of course, when you're already thinking about the demographics of an aging population, that that's a huge number and childcare costs play a massive part in that. Yeah, definitely. And I think for a lot of people at the moment, it's, you know, the cost of living crisis, it's sky high rents, meaning that people can't get on the property ladder. And then they think, well, on top of all that, we can't afford childcare costs, but also we can't afford to be out of work looking after children um, and not having that income. And I think there's an element of this where I think younger people are a bit more financially savvy. They're a bit more financially aware than maybe some previous generations. Um, But the flip side to that is that it means they're very aware of how much these things are going to cost them and the financial implications of them. But yeah, I think we were all quite shocked at that huge figure. Um, But it also feels very believable to me. I can see that. Um, And we also looked at some some figures of um, how many people were factoring in finances into whether they would have more children. So, you know, existing parents weighing up whether they'd have that second or third or maybe fourth child. Um, And finances is a huge factor in that decision. Yeah, I must admit, for me, I had wanted to have more than two children. And we just decided once we'd had our second child that there was absolutely no way that we could afford to have three. Uh, Now that the girls are teenagers and one of them's about to start learning to drive and the other one just has an obsession with makeup, I'm actually really glad that we didn't go for three because I have no idea how we'd be able to afford it. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, and also I think one of the interesting um, discussions we've had around that is lots of people think about children up until the age of 18, but actually the financially the tie is far longer than that. It's, you know, university, which is now so expensive. It's then potentially, you know, the bank of mum and dad helping them out with getting on the property ladder or even with a deposit for a flat to rent, it's, you know, it's not just at 18 years and right, done and dusted off the books. So I can see why that's a big, big factor. Um, For me, I think the thing in the research was, was the extent of the single tax. So we've 
talked a bit about this before, about, you know, the financial implications of being single and the fact that it means that you have to pay rent on your own and council tax and bills and that that financial burden is is much higher. But what we really wanted to focus on is the long term impact of that. So the longer term impact of being single for a while. Um, And actually, the stats on that are so good that in our next podcast, we're going to delve into that. And we're going to look at all of the research that we've got on that. But we're also going to hear from some wonderful single ladies about the impact that it's had on their money of being single. But that is almost it for this episode. And I know that there is no confession this week. And I feel, Laura, that it is your turn to confess something. I felt like this day might come. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I've been waiting. I know. So I had a think, and last night, really laid bare, uh, my husband was buying travel insurance for us because we're going on holiday soon. Um, And I realised, so whilst I talk about how everyone should talk a lot about money and know exactly how much is going in and out, I delegate financial things to my husband and then I have absolutely no idea how much he spends on them or how much they cost. He's in charge of all insurances and I couldn't tell you how much our car insurance is or house insurance or travel insurance. You could pluck a number out of the air. He could be buying the most expensive policy possible, which he probably is, and I just have no idea. And I think because I've delegated it, I'm then like, I don't need to know any more about that and I don't want to know any more about that. I've got enough (laughs) other things to sort out. But that is not really practicing what I preach about making sure that you know about all areas of your finances however you have to delegate I'm not motivated (laughs) enough to actually ask him and I I think you do have to delegate because otherwise you you can't take it all on there's no way that you could be across absolutely everything even with your spreadsheets I know and he is a lover of spreadsheets too that is why this marriage works but um I don't know if he's entering it into a spreadsheet I don't have a clue (laughs) <laughs> but all I know is that we will have insurance and that's all that I really care about, I think. <laughs> and you will have a holiday, which, again, we know is your big passion. Look, I promise normal service will be resumed next time. But in the meantime, we would absolutely love to hear your financial confessions. And if you missed in our last episode with the brilliant Lisa Snowden, who really did open up about her life, getting older, the menopause, it is available wherever you get your pods. For now, that is everything for us. So do take a look at that report. You can find it on ajbellmoneymatters.co.uk. And until next time, thanks for listening. Before you go, please remember this podcast is for educational purposes and the views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of AJ Bell. The podcast isn't telling you whether certain investments are suitable or not. And don't forget that the value of investments can change and you can lose money as well as make it. It's also important to remember that tax rules apply and that the way an investment performed in the past may not be the same as how it behaves in the future. If you want help, go see a qualified financial advisor.